Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to this, the second in our Charities and Third Sector Spring Webinar series covering health and safety obligations. My name is Kenneth Pinkerton, and I am Director of Charities and Third Sector here at Brodie's. So, over to you, Kate and Alison. Well, hello, and thank you um, to everyone who's come along today. Uh, today, we're going to look at the um, health and safety responsibilities for charities and third sector organisations. We'll consider which organisations need to meet health and safety requirements and who can be prosecuted for a criminal offence if those obligations are breached. We'll then move on to look at what might happen after a health and safety incident and what you can do to minimise the impact on your organisation. But before we get into those questions, I think it's worthwhile starting with a very high level overview of the UK's health and safety system. Uh, health and safety is a matter which is reserved to the UK government, it's not devolved to the Scottish government. And for all of Great Britain, but not Northern Ireland, it, there is one system for health and safety. The overarching or parent legislation here is the Health and Safety at Work Act 1974, and it's based on the principle that those who create risks to employees or, or others in the course of carrying out work activities are responsible for controlling those risks. And very broadly, the Act sets out the duties, it identifies the duty holders, it establishes the health and safety executive, it creates the powers to make regulations, and those regulations hold the detail um, of the duties, and it provides power of enforcement and sanctions. And from that, the health and safety regime in the UK flows. If a person or organisation breaches a duty imposed by the Act, they are guilty of a criminal offence and can be subject to criminal prosecution. Until 2013, they were also liable in damages to anyone who was harmed by that breach in a civil claim. Since 2013, there's no longer an automatic right to damages because of a breach of the duties, but it does remain a good basis for a civil claim. So who is subject to health and safety requirements? Who are the health and safety duty holders? Well, those are set out, as I said, in the Act, and they are employers, self-employed people, people who have, to any extent, control of non-domestic premises, and that can seem a bit of an odd one, and that's where that person or its or his organisation is carrying on a trade, business, or other undertaking, um, and importantly here, whether for profit or not, manufacturers and suppliers where they are supplying articles or substances for work and also for fairground equipment and finally employees themselves OGTs in terms of health and safety and so even with only one employee or none at all an organization can be subject to these health and safety duties and those duties um, will apply whether or not your organisation is not for profit or charitable, the nature of the business isn't relevant. There's no difference between a small local or not for profit organisation and a large international commercial organisation. If the conditions are met, the duties will apply. The HAC says the size of the business and its financial strength do not determine the health and safety standards to be achieved. So that's not relevant um, when considering whether the duties apply um, or what they might be. And just to pick up on that, um, Kate, um, in the sort of scenario where you don't control a workplace or you don't have any paid employees, um, but you do have a squad of volunteers who are carrying out work for that organisation, how does that interact with that? Well, that's a tricky one. And I know that um, for uh, organisations in the third sector, the, the level of employee relationships is really quite low. Um, the HSE's position is that the same care should be afforded to volunteers as employees. But in terms of the Health and Safety at Work Act um, and the duty holders defined, there would need to be at least one paid employee among that squad um, for the duty to apply or some other criteria such as the control um, of a non-domestic premises. And I suppose that then begs the question of what is an employee for yeah. these purposes? Yeah, and that is a question which is <laughs> dog several areas of law. And I suppose the, the sort of glib answer would be it's not something which can be easily defined. But here it doesn't matter because it doesn't apply to volunteers. And so 
there is what is really an anomalous situation. So if an organisation has one paid employee and a volunteer is injured, that organisation could face criminal prosecution under the Health and Safety at Work Act. But if there are no employees, then the organisation can't be prosecuted for the same failing, which resulted in the same injury to the same person. And there are some groups who think that the law should be extended to close this apparent gap. And I think it's key here to remember that once an organisation is a duty holder, it owes duties not just to its employees, but also to non-employees, self-employed workers um, vol and volunteers. And it can be prosecuted for a criminal offence if it breaches uh, those duties. And I think this is another, um, or is a good point to highlight that there are two streams of consequences which can flow um, from failing to meet health and safety obligations, the criminal um, and the civil. Um, so a, a criminal um, obligation obviously can result in a criminal offence being committed, it can result in prosecution and a conviction, and it can result in a, a prison sentence um, or a very high fine in the worst case scenarios. A civil claim is a claim for damages, um, and it's a claim which we'll come on to consider um, can be covered by insurance. So if an organisation is a duty holder, it, it or individuals within it can be prosecuted for a criminal offence if the rules are breached. Um, that would normally follow an accident or incident, but in fact, there doesn't need to be an incident or accident. The offence is, is, is committed by breaking the rules. Um, and the other thing that can happen, as I said, is that someone can sue the organisation for damages. And if an organisation isn't a duty holder, it can't be prosecuted for a criminal offence, but it can be sued for damages if something goes wrong. And we're going to look into those processes in a bit more detail uh, later on. But even if an organisation is not a duty holder in terms of the Health and Safety Act, health and safety law and its requirements shouldn't be ignored. And that's not just because the organisation could be sued. Health and safety can be an unpopular subject. It can be viewed as a barrier, an unwelcome expense, introducing an unnecessary red tape, or as a way of avoiding getting things done. For that reason, it might be tempting to think, can I avoid health and safety duties? Do I really need to ensure that my organisation complies? But it, never mind the ways in which health and safety can be characterised or even misused by some, what is the underlying purpose? And quite simply, it's to make things safer, less unpleasant, to protect people from injury, most certainly a good aim. And sometimes we can think of the time and money spent on ensuring health and safety compliance as an investment. It will reduce the likelihood of accidents and events, prevent financial and other resources being expended and avoid negative publicity. But it's not just that. Time and money spent on health and safety enriches the organisation, it makes it a better place to be, it makes its role more positive, more responsible, and it brings common benefit to all those touched by the organisation. And importantly here for charities in the third sector, trustees and others responsible for the management of charities have obligations to act in the interests of the charity in good faith and to operate in a manner consistent with the charity's purposes and with the care and diligence that's reasonable to expect of a person managing the affairs of another. It's difficult to imagine that those responsibilities could be met without complying with the letter and the spirit of health and safety requirements. And in order for health and safety to be well managed, there really needs to be buy-in at board and management level. We know from experience in other sectors that when this happens, the safety of those working within the organisation can improve drastically. And to take a, a good example, in construction, the annual number of fatal accidents was halved in 10 years following a commitment at organisational level to managing health and safety. And so that's the importance of health and safety. But if we assume now that an organisation is subject to health and safety duties and it has breached those, what will happen to it and the individuals associated with its operation? Who can be prosecuted? As with other areas of charity law, there's a difference here between incorporated and unincorporated organisations. A limited company has a legal personality and it will be prosecuted in its own name. For trusts, if they're not incorporate, incorporated, the trustees will be prosecuted in their name, but collectively and as trustees of the trust. And similarly for unincorporated organisations such as sports clubs and local interest groups, the office bearers, the secretary and so on will be prosecuted, but as office bearers and not as individuals.
However, and this is important, Section 37 of the Health and Safety Act allows for the prosecution of individuals as well as or instead of the duty holder where the breach has come about because of their consent, connivance or neglect. And this means that individuals will not be entirely protected from the possibility of prosecution by incorporation of the organisation. And that's important uh, to remember. But when would the HSE seek prosecution of individuals and in general, the prosecution of an individual as well as or instead of the organisation itself will be warranted where there have been personal acts or feelings and it would be proportionate to prosecute. The underlying principle it comes back to the fact that those who are responsible for the risk and best place to control it should bear the consequences. And the HSE guidance states that prosecution of individuals will be appropriate where there's been either reckless disregard for health and safety requirements or a deliberate act or omission which has given rise to significant risks. And so it won't happen every time there's been a breach, but it's not unusual for the HSE to investigate individuals within an organisation as well as at the, and at the same time as it investigates the organisation itself. And it's important on a practical level to remember that separate legal representation might be required because of the possibility for conflicts of interest here. And it can also make things uh, on a practical level because it can limit the conversations that an organization can have with its office bearers, trustees, or directors. And so what might happen after a health and safety incident? Alison's going to take a look at the detail of the different processes which can follow a health and safety incident. But just before she does, I want to pause here to mention a couple of things which your organization should have in mind if there is an incident. And the first is um, notifying the event to Oscar. As you might be aware, from April 2016, charities have been asked to report notifiable events to Oscar. It's an effort on Oscar's part to prevent problems occurring and to help minimize the impact of significant events if they do occur, both on individual charities and on the wider charity sector. There's some really helpful guidance available on Oscar's website, but briefly, a notifiable event is described by Oscar as being an event that has a significant impact on your charity, and that will depend on the nature, size, and operation of the organization. It's for the charity trustees to decide whether the event is serious enough to be reported to Oscar, but a health and safety event could tie in with some of the examples given in Oscar's guidance, for example, one which causes a substantial financial loss, and that would be the case if there was a sentence for a large fine or incidents of abuse or mistreatment of vulnerable beneficiaries. And of course, there's, there's a clear possibility for a crossover there between something which is a health and safety breach, but is also an abuse or mistreatment of vulnerable people. Um, and where the charity has been subject to criminal investigation or investigation by another regulator, sanctions have been imposed or concerns raised by another regulator or agency, and clearly an investigation by the police or HSE would be very likely to meet that criteria. Oscar's guidance states that the regulator would like to hear about the event as soon as possible, although it, it is understood that trustees may need time to look at the issue and decide how to address it before reporting the event to Oscar. But the point is that consideration should be given to reporting the incident to Oscar as soon as possible after it occurs. And this ties into the wider duty to act in the best interest of the charity. It can also help with mitigating any fallout from the health and safety breach, which we're also going to go on to look at in a bit more detail. The second thing I wanted to bring up here is insurance, and we'll be talking about insuring adequate ensuring adequate cover uh, shortly, but for the moment there are a couple of things which should be in mind um, when something happens. In the first place, you must tell your insurer if there's been an incident as soon as possible after it happens, and this is important because you may be at risk of breaching the terms of your insurance if you don't report an incident, and that could invalidate your insurance claim, remove your cover. It can also be tempting sometimes to try and sort things out within the organisation, but again, you could be putting your insurance cover at risk if, for example, you agree to compensate someone who's been harmed without telling your insurer. The key thing is that your insurance cover is dependent on you fulfilling your end of the insurance contract and notification and cooperation after an event are a very important part of that. The second thing is, if you're being investigated by the HSE or other enforcement body, then you should have legal representation as soon as possible to support and protect the organisation during the investigation. 
While your insurance policy will likely provide cover for the legal costs incurred as a result of the investigation, it may not provide you with immediate representation. It is possible to nominate solicitors on your policy so that your own solicitors with knowledge of your organisation can represent you when something happens. And at Brodie's, we do this quite frequently and we've been able to get to our clients almost immediately after something's happened. The final point at this stage is to note that, unfortunately, insurance is not a cure-all uh, for all health and safety, all the, the outcomes of a health and safety incident. And one important example of that is that your insurance policy will not cover the cost of a fine in a criminal prosecution. This will always be payable directly by the organisation. In addition, there will be internal costs to the organisation following an incident which will not be reimbursed. For example, the time um, of trustees or others to deal with an incident, investigations, time out of other worker projects to give statements or to attend court. And the reputational harm caused by an accident or investigation will also not be avoid avoided. Any prosecution or civil litigation will be in the name of the organisation or its key individuals. And so, Alison, I'll now pass on to you to look at the detail of the different processes which can follow after an incident. Thanks very much, Kate. So, as Kate said, there's two streams that can flow from a health and safety incident. And the first one we're going to look at is the criminal prosecution and investigation. Immediately after an incident, the police, HSE or a local authority inspector perhaps might attend your premises, which is the very beginning of the legal process, as their investigation could lead to criminal charges against the organisation or against individuals. There might also be other regulators involved, depending on the nature of your organisation, for example, the care inspectorate. The investigator who comes is going to be looking to establish whether the organisation is complying with its legal obligations. They're looking for evidence of the approach individuals and the organisation as a whole takes to health and safety. They might speak to trustees, to employees, to volunteers, to service users, to factual witnesses who actually saw the incident and of course if anyone was injured, the injured person as well. And they can ask a lot of questions. They can ask first of all about what happened and the actual facts of the incident. But they can also go deeper and look at the policies or any procedures that were in place. How did this activity come about in the first place? Who wrote the procedure for this or were they actually qualified to do that? And was this procedure followed? They're going to, of course, want to look at all your health and safety documentation. So things like accident reports, risk assessments, policies, even emails and potentially internal communications as well. And it's not enough to have those documents in place it's something the investigator is going to want to look at to know if they're relevant and if they're actually being prepared by someone who is competent to do that and of course whether they've been followed in practice. As Kate said this all takes time and resources away from what the organisation would otherwise be doing so ideally you don't want to get into this situation if you can possibly avoid it. One other point to note is that it might become apparent in the course of the investigation that there is somebody as an individual who requires their own legal representation if, as Kate said, HSE or the police are looking at the individual rather than the group as a whole. Again, as we said before, it's worth considering if your insurance is going to cover that and how that's going to be managed between the separate legal representation between the organisation and the individual. And this slide just has some of the powers that police and other regulators have when they come to your premises after a health and safety incident. And we're not going to go through all of these, but as you can see, they are quite substantial and they can involve quite invasive investigations which are going to disrupt your organisation. Things like taking documents or copies of documents away, taking your property or equipment away, taking statements, speaking to individuals. It's an offence to impede the police or HSE while they're investigating, so you do have to cooperate. And as Kate said, this can all take quite a lot of time out of your organisation and can be quite disruptive to your day to day working as well. We would always say that you should take legal advice if somebody's going on site and you might want to have your legal team there as well to provide you with support. Once the investigation is complete in Scotland, HSE or the police will pass their findings to the Crown Office and Procurator Fiscal Service. And that's slightly different to England and Wales where HSE can prosecute in its own name. Up here, it's the fiscal's decision of whether to prosecute, first of all, or whether this has actually been dealt with by, for example, an enforcement notice by HSE or by a change in procedure. If they do want to prosecute, they have to then decide who to prosecute, whether that's an organisation or an individual. 
and what the details of that charge are going to be and how serious the offence is. Prosecution takes time and it may be years after the event before it actually comes to court. And alternatively, even if there isn't a prosecution, if it's a death of an individual, there may be a fatal accident inquiry, which is not a prosecution as such, but a public examination of the facts of what happened. As you might have seen in the press recently, there have been a few um, fatal accident inquiries that have taken place in the last year or so, which were 10 or 11 years after the incident itself. So all of this can take quite a long time from that first initial incident. And that's obviously quite a lot to be hanging over the organisation during that time. At the end of this process, if there is a prosecution and either the organisation or an individual is found guilty, there will be a sentence arising from that. These are just some of the examples of sentences that can come out of a health and safety incident. Now, sentencing could actually be a whole presentation in itself, but briefly, there's sentencing guidelines available to the courts in which apply in England and Wales but have also been followed in Scotland as a helpful guide for judges deciding what sentence should be passed in a case. The guidelines provide a matrix of how a fine should be calculated for a health and safety offence based on factors such as turnover. So it's not profit or money that's available after your costs, it's the amount of money moving through the organisation. The figures are also calculated based on the level of risk and on the level of culpability or how much to blame the organisation is and how serious the injury was, whether it was a minor injury or, for example, up to a serious injury or death. On the slide, we have some examples of fines and custodial sentences over the past few years for charitable or non-profit organisations. And as you can see, they are significant and there's fines into the tens or hundreds of thousands of pounds. And the sentencing guidelines are designed to actually have an impact on the organisation. So for example, for St Albans Football Club, although the fine is a thousand pounds, that will have been calculated to consider how much of an impact that's going to have on the organisation. I should say as well that these are by no means the highest sentences we have seen handed down by the courts in health and safety prosecutions. In examples where there are large organisations with high turnover, they can run potentially into the millions of pounds. So the second stream of legal process that can come from a health and safety breach is a civil claim. This is generally a claim for compensation, which can be made immediately after an incident or where there's a criminal, criminal prosecution, it can be delayed until after that process is complete. Even if there isn't a criminal prosecution, as Kate said, there may well be a civil claim that is relying on the breach of the health and safety law. A civil claim can be made for personal injury, which should be raised within, in court within three years of the incident occurring, or for property damage caused by the incident, which has a slightly longer time limit of five years in Scotland. It should be noted these are only the start dates. A civil court case, if it goes to proof or what's also known as a trial, will generally take at least nine months from when it is raised as an action in the first place. And it can be much longer if the case is complicated or if there's numbers of parties involved. So that means that you're looking at potentially three, four, five, even six years after the incident has actually occurred. The standard of proof in a criminal case is that the charge must be proved beyond reasonable doubt. But for civil cases, it's a slightly lower burden. It's on balance of probabilities. So the test is whether it's more likely than not for the claim to be successful. As we said earlier on, it's important to ensure your organisation has the appropriate insurance cover for compensation and legal costs. This will vary depending on what your organisation does. There are a couple of key examples of types of insurance we've noted on the slide. And Kate, I know that employer's liability is one that obviously raises quite a few red flags in cases that come to us. Well, employer's liability insurance is compulsory. So if you have employees, it's a criminal offence not to have employer's liability insurance. And the fine for not having can be quite punishing. It's £2,500 a day for every day that you're without cover. Um, and there can also be a fine of £1,000 for not displaying your certificate or providing it when asked. Um, and so that that's obviously a very serious consideration if you have employees. Um, but with the issue of volunteers, it can also sometimes be a bit unclear um, which cover they would come under. Um, and so in that case, it's just about being um, very straightforward with the insurer or your broker about what it is you do and who it is that does it for you. But then checking that the policy you have covers you um, because sometimes volunteers can fall between the two stools of employers liability and public liability insurance. 
Absolutely. And the other key one we've noted there is trustee liability cover. And as we said earlier, this provides potential cover for individual trustees and their legal costs if they're being pursued in a case. But it is important to be mindful of potential conflicts. Kate, again, I think you had some thoughts on this. Yeah, I mean, I think that's what we've talked about a couple of times now, which is where you might find that an individual within the organisation is being investigated separately uh, to the organisation and that they will need their own lawyers. And so it's important that trustee liability cover provides cover or indemnity to the individual trustees so that their own legal costs would be met if they are the subject of an investigation or ultimately a prosecution. Absolutely. Thanks, Kate. So having considered that process, what is the impact of all that going to be on your organisation? And we're really tying back into what Kate said earlier, that not all of the costs that are going to be borne by the organisation for a health and safety incident can be protected by insurance. You see on the slide here that the points marked in pink are some of the losses that might potentially come to the organisation that can't be covered by insurance from a civil proceedings perspective. So yes, you can get potentially cover for compensation, for expert reports, investigations, for legal costs, but things like lost funding opportunities if your organisation or individuals within it have a criminal record, or if potential funders are more reluctant to engage with you because you have a history of health and safety breaches. The time it takes to actually deal with an incident and a claim on the way through as you're doing the investigations of people having to take time out of their days to compile evidence, to give statements or to attend court, as well as the management level of overseeing how all that's going and liaising with legal teams. And lastly, as Kate mentioned, also the reputational damage that can arise. If there has been a major incident, there's a good likelihood that there'll be press coverage in some way about it. And that's something that can impact both your own team and your service users. You might find there's a loss of trust from the community if they don't perceive your organisation as keeping them safe. And likewise, for your own employees and volunteers, there may be less trust and potentially low morale if there's a perception that, again, people's safety isn't being put forward. So that's all the processes that can come out of an incident and some of the impact it can have. We're just going to take some time now to have a wee look at what you can do to mitigate that sort of impact and really minimise the possibility of a breach once it's happened, the impact on your organisation. There's two sides to this and from a pre-incident perspective, which we'll come on to in a moment. But first of all, I really would recommend having a look at HSE's own website and their guidance. It's designed to be user-friendly and it has sections on health and safety responsibilities, various regulations and all sorts of resources to help depending on what your organisation does. And this template here is one of HSEs and it's one that we always mention in our webinars because it's a really helpful reminder of what you should be doing when you are dealing with health and safety in your organisation. And it's plan, do, check, act. So that's plan your activities and have policies in place. Do implement those policies and organise so that you can use those effectively. As you go through, check that they are working, measure performance and investigate if there are any accidents or near misses, why did they happen? And lastly, act. You want to act on any lessons you should be learning. If there has been an incident or near miss, what do you need to do about that? Do you need to plan your activity in a different way? Do you need to put more measures in place? And it's also a helpful reminder that this should be a circular process. Once you have health and safety documents, that shouldn't be the end of it. You should be constantly reviewing and updating to try and build and improve your processes even further. So when you're coming in to look at your organisation from a health and safety perspective, there's one key question that Kate and I decided is probably the key one, okay, the linchpin of the whole thing, which is what does my organisation do? And it, it sounds like a simple question, but it's really, I think there's a lot more to it than chemistry the eye, Kate. Yeah, I think it sounds trite when we say it to people that this is the first and possibly uh, the most important step in any kind of management of health and safety risks, because very often organisations at, at board or managerial level don't actually know everything that the organisation does or certainly how it's done. Um, and if you don't know what you're doing and you don't, you can't then assess what risks are generated by it and you certainly can't manage them so the first step is a really a big step back and a look at the organization as a whole and, and finding out what's being done and how it's being done and who it's being done by um, and, and once you have that you can look at assessing the risk 
Absolutely. And it's things that can come about in a number of ways that the organisation may have grown organically and started offering new services or branched out into new sectors over time. Or you may have merged with another organisation and taken on their activities with the result that potentially no one's really taken that step back that Kate mentioned and had a look at how that's actually come about and whether it's actually safe to do it in that way. And long standing activities is perversely can be as much of a risk as a brand new activity, I would say, Kate. Yeah, and that's just because things, there's an attitude sometimes that it's ever been done that way and no one's actually stopped and looked at it fresh and thought, well, should we be doing that? Is that just actually unacceptably risky? Is there a better way we can do it, which is less risky? And so I suppose you know, there's an element of complacency there or, or blindness to things that have been going on for so long and, and, and a proper look at that is really needed. And the complete contrast to that is obviously over the last year, a lot of organisations in all sorts of sectors have been branching out and doing different things to deal with COVID. And there's been some really fantastic work done because of that. And you see things in the news like drinks companies switching over to make hand sanitizer, or um, football clubs have been starting to do outreach to their um, season ticket holders just to do well-being phone calls and things like that. But if that's happening and your organisation has started doing something in panic mode for want of a better phrase or just straight to deal with the crisis then it might be worth seeing has anyone actually sat down and looked at this and checked how we're doing it are we doing it properly have we looked at the risks of this and are we comfortable it's being done in a safe way and also do our insurers know we're doing this if it's something you've never done before are you actually covered for that and just the answer may well be yes to all of that but it's just about that taking that step back and making sure you've thought about it absolutely so from there, the next question to ask is, after you've kind of established, what actually does my organisation do day to day? What risks are generated by that? And what do we do to manage those risks? Is there a policy or procedure that we have for that? And if there's not, should we have one? The next question to ask is, who's managing that situation? And are they qualified to do that? Is there somebody in your organisation who can prepare a risk assessment or a policy? Or is it something you need to get some advice on? That can potentially be a difficult conversation to have, again, if there's somebody who's always been in charge of this particular area, and now you're finding that actually there's more that needs to be done, but it's so important to have it. And that's what Kate was saying about really having that buy-in from trustees and from top level within the organisation so that it filters down to your employees and to your volunteers. The health and safety is very important. And the last question, which we keep saying, but we'll say it again, is do you have appropriate insurance cover? And just making sure that the cover you have matches up to the activities you're doing. I think for other ways to kind of mitigate the impact of an incident, there's two sides to this from a pre-incident perspective. Firstly, being prepared might help avoid an incident altogether. Having plans and procedures in place, making sure they're being followed and learning from any incidents or near misses can help you avoid a major breach in the first place. Secondly, being prepared in advance means if an incident does occur, you're ready to deal with it as effectively as possible. So that includes things like ensuring you have a paper trail. If you have risk assessments, keeping a folder of them. If they're updated or replaced, keeping copies of the old and new versions, keeping health and safety policies, activity plans, things like that, that are frequently reviewed and kept up to date. You should also be frequently discussing health and safety, for example, as a standing point on the agenda for regular meetings. Having a major incident protocol or a checklist of things to do if an incident does occur can help in what will often be quite a distressing or difficult situation. If someone's been injured, the last thing you want to do is have to be running around trying to work out what to do next and having a go-to guide can really help with that. Overall, the key message here is be prepared and these are all things that we or your own solicitors can help with if you're looking to improve on the kind of the protocols you have in place and it's something that's really worth the time looking at. If an incident does occur, then recognising that it's an issue and engaging at an early stage can make all the difference. As we've said, it's important to notify your insurer and you might also want to think about notifying Oscar. You should also contact your legal team because they can really give you some support, either dealing with the regulator or HSE or with the police, with on-site investigations. They can help you on the ground and be, as Kate said, we've had cases where we've been there on the day to provide support to our clients there and then after an incident. And they can also advise on legal privilege as well. As we've said, it's not enough to have policies and procedures in place, but make sure your own staff and team understand these and know what to do with them. So if an incident does occur, everyone knows what the role is and what they need to do. As we said, having a major incident protocol 
is really helpful for that, but equally your staff need to know that it's there and how to use it as well to make it most effective. It's not only for employees who might be present if an accident happens, but also about the senior staff who might be involved afterwards in the investigation or gathering evidence. Really training them to understand what they're doing can really help to capture all that evidence effectively. And then that investigation itself has a number of purposes. Firstly, to identify any compliance gaps and improve systems to prevent future incidents, to mitigate or potentially avoid prosecution. If you can present a clear picture that actually your organization is very prepared and this was just an unfortunate accident, then that might help to deal with any prosecution or civil claim. And lastly, having that written evidence, as we said, can help if the trial or proof in a civil case is several years after the event. It's a long time, staff change, volunteers move on. You want to have all that evidence captured as early as you can. So hope that's been helpful and we've got some time for Q&A in just a minute or two. Um, but just wanted to let you know some of the ways that Brodies can help and that we'd obviously be happy to discuss with you after today's presentation. Firstly is our app. This is a free to download app available on our website. So please feel free to download and have a look around. It's designed to help organisations prepare for and deal with health and safety incidents. It includes lots of resources, things like checklists, handy guides and articles. So feel free to have a browse. As we said, having documents in place can really help. So if anyone wants to discuss things like major incident protocols or stale documents, do let us know. And lastly, providing legal support. If unfortunately there is an incident, we can be there providing support either virtually or on site and can also provide training on all of that as well. So hope all that's been useful, but Kenneth, I'll pass back to you to field any questions that have come in on the Q&A. Thanks, Kate and Alison. Well, as, as a trustee of a couple of charities, I certainly found that really useful and I'm sure our attendees did as well. Just a, a couple of questions have come in. You mentioned the various policies that you might have. Um, how regularly would you recommend that they, they are reviewed? I think there's a couple of answers to that. For policies, you should be reviewing them regularly anyway. So probably I would say at least once a year as you go through, but also in general, you should be reviewing them anytime there is a major change to your organisation. So if, as we said, you've taken on a new activity or there's been a merger or a change in governance, for example, those are good times to update as well. So it's something that should be a living document. It shouldn't be you prepared your policy, put it in a drawer, that's it sorted for another five years. It should yeah. be something that every time something major happens, you're thinking, do we need to update that? And if the answer is no, even just making a note saying we've checked it, it's still fine. That's all you need to do. But it's worth keeping it in mind just as you're going through that ongoing process. Yeah, and, and certainly as a charity trustee, um, if we've got charity trustees in the audience, then you, you would certainly have to have some oversight that that is being done and you would have to take steps to ensure that, that you know that those policies are being reviewed, whether that's you know a report from this uh, your senior legal team, sorry, your senior leadership team or, or others. Um, somebody has asked, um, what do you mean by qualified person and what type of training is expected? I think that must be in relation to who's doing your, your reporting. Mm -hmm. And I think, Kate, you be jumping on this one as well, but it's, it's going to sound like a, a get out answer. It's not meant to be at all. It really depends on your organisation and that depending what the activities you are doing. Basically, you want somebody doing risk assessments or preparing documents who has experience in what you're doing. And for more risky activities, you want it to be somebody with health and safety um, qualifications but it doesn't have to be if it's somebody if it's a you know a, a relatively straightforward one somebody who's familiar with the process and can sit and go through the potential risks might be sufficient so it sounds like a bit of a say a bit it depends kind yeah. of answer but that is really the answer it depends on what the activity is yeah I mean there is training available IOSH is an organization which offers people qualifications in health and safety so that would be things like risk assessment drafting um, safe systems of work um, but that might that might not be necessary um, the HSE has very good guidance online which tells people how to look at drafting risk assessments what they should include and the considerations they should take into account but what the person who is doing the risk assessment or writing the policy must have as Ali said is a knowledge of the activity 
they need to know what it involves. Um, they might get that by speaking to people that do the activity, but they would need to understand what that meant in the real world. So by qualified, I think we mean have the suitable skills and knowledge to carry out. It's not a case of looking for formal qualifications, although those are available if it, if it was thought that would be proportionate and helpful. Thanks. Um, if there is an incident, will HSE take into account the steps that you've that you as an organisation are taking on health and safety? Yeah, that's a really important thing to, to mention, actually. So if you have an accident in your organisation and the health and safety approach is good and you do have good procedures and good training and good engagement with that, um, the HSE might be persuaded when they first attend that actually this is really genuinely an accident um, and that there's no interest in in public interest in prosecuting um, or even if they, they, they're not persuaded that far in terms of the approach that will be taken that during the prosecution and the sentencing it will be very helpful if the organisation can demonstrate that it takes health and safety seriously and that it's a responsible organisation operating in that way and conversely if there is no um, responsibility taken for health and safety and there's a sort of reckless um, attitude towards it that would that would be very unhelpful for an organization if it were being investigated and so it's not a case that you can put all this effort into health and safety but if something happens it's all been for for naught it it is important and it is a, a sort of a key part of the story that will that will play into any prosecution yeah so it definitely stands you in good stead and we've got time for just one last question um you mentioned prosecutions and some of the sentences earlier on. Are there lots of HSE cases out there? Do, do they prosecute many organisations in reality, or is it just the odd one here and there? So it's it's definitely more than the odd one here and there. Um, the most recent stats, which were for 2019-2020, um, I think it's about 325 prosecutions um, by HSE or referred to the Crown in Scotland. Um, but aside from that, there was also over 7,000 enforcement notices. So that's the lower level enforcement by HSE that either an improvement notice or potentially a prohibition notice has been issued to improve or prevent an activity going ahead. And overall prosecution numbers have been falling over the past few years. There was a high a few years ago um, where it was, I think, about double the cases that were prosecuted last year. Um, so there is a decrease in prosecutions but that said they are obviously still quite high and the, and the level of fines is still I think it's around about 35 million pounds at the moment for um, fines arising from prosecutions so it's not going to be you know they're, they're not on every street corner but equally there will still be prosecutions and they will go after the more serious cases in particular. Thanks very much and that's us um, just out of time just now. So I'd like to thank everybody who came along this afternoon for, for your kind attention and hope that you found the session useful. 